Welcome back to the Union Street Podcast. We have another episode today in the studio with Paul Elledge and Antonio Martinez. Thank you guys for being here today. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Luke. It's good to see you again, Antonio, back in the studio. Likewise. Might be familiar with Antonio. We've had him on before. Might remember the mural. Uh, but we're here to focus on Paul and this new project, uh, this photography project that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Want to hear about your background, mm -hmm. some of your process. Okay. And this project specifically, too, and how this all relates. And Antonio's connected us both now. And a part of the project, too, right? I right. just photographed him. Very cool. An hour ago. Yeah. So very good. I'm very glad to have you guys. And, uh, you know, uh, make sure you like this video. Subscribe to this podcast. We have a new podcast every Friday at noon Central Standard Time. So be on the lookout for more episodes as we continue releasing the Union Street Podcast. Okay. So, Paul, where should we start? Can you take us to the beginning? Take us to the beginning. <laughs> the beginning, well, um, I went to Carbondale, graduated in 81, and uh, then went to Chicago and tried to find myself and as a photographer. Ended up doing advertising, working for big on big ad campaigns, a lot of album covers, did videos for MTV and TV commercials and blah, blah, blah. And so I like to tell people that I photographed everybody from people on death row to the presence of the United States and most everything in between. <laughs> wow. Every, that's like a wide variety of a wide life. variety. Yeah. So it's really about, you know, um, I photograph humanity on every level. So a lot of my job, I've been fortunate to have met a lot of really interesting people that have done really great things and some, uh, not so great. But they all have a story to tell. They all have a story. So the pictures are really about a, a narrative portrait. They're not just a facade. I try to make pictures that have a lot more human emotion and connection that tell a story. Yeah. You mentioned uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> in the blah, blah, blah moments, um, so um, you mentioned you photographed probably you know, people in the limelight as mm -hmm. well as yep. others that are not probably in the shadows. Um, is there one uh, limelight uh, subject that really stands out for you, especially in your early career? Well, I have to think on that for a second. I mean, <clears throat> early on, I was shooting a lot of music stuff. And in Chicago in the 90s, a lot of music stuff became <clears throat> big, giant music stuff. Uh, uh, bands like Ministry and Smashing Pumpkins and things like this that I did a lot of work for. And um, and also Oprah Winfrey. So, I mean, it was a huge range just even then, you know. Uh, the 90s had a lot of energy in Chicago, and that took me more to a world stage because I was working on people that, be, that went to the world stage, and I just hung on tight. As they, as they went up, I went up with them as much as I could. But um, I'd say a lot of my relationships with uh, music acts has, have really influenced me because I was much more allowed to put my point of view into the work mm -hmm. and express myself in the more in a much clearer way than you would with advertising. It's your point of view, but it's much more sanitized for the general public where music is really strategic towards, you know, their audience. So, which is my audience. So it worked. So during this time, you know, nineties, obviously before digital, mm -hmm. um, can you speak about, uh, your, this kind of folded into your process because I'm, you obviously were using film mm -hmm. back then. Uh, can you, for those of you, I guess the, the listeners, um, they're young and old, uh, speak about the technology and yeah, the, sure. in the nineties. Yeah. I mean, it was all film based. Uh, I was very much into incorporating vintage aesthetic with modern point of view. Um, that vintage aesthetic came from my parents used to take me a lot to flea markets. So a lot of my photography came from looking at, um, uh, daguerreotypes and, uh, albumin prints and these portraits that were from a long, long time ago. And so a lot of my aesthetic was this connection of those eyes that you see in those photographs. And then with this very um, kind of authentic feel of connection, there wasn't a facade where I'm trying to sell something. It just was real. And so I incorporated that a lot into my work, not only with the way I directed people to look, but also in the technology I use. So I blended a lot of vintage equipment 
from the you know 30s or 40s with modern lighting and modern ideas, modern film stocks. I did a lot of uh, drawing on negatives, and I did a lot of handwork also because I wanted to have an organic feel to the work. I was always trying to get away from slickness and um, create more texture. <clears throat> if you look at a picture like the album cover for a ministry record called Psalm 69, it's uh, three exposures, multiple exposures, drawn on the negative, printed in the darkroom with layers and things like this. To if you look at the single uh, 1979, Smashing Pumpkins, it's a, it's a you know flash with motion because I wanted it not to be super sharp. So there's like a little bit of shake and, shake and bake in that. So I was always trying to make pictures that had the human emotion in them. The um, photo shoot you did uh, an hour ago with me, um, I, you know, I was observing your your approach and even your cues you're having me. I imagine I was probably getting pretty stiff or mm -hmm. you had me like, now close your eyes, take a deep breath, exhale, now open your eyes and mm -hmm. you're um, getting that shot. Um, and I was thinking like, why is, why is he asking me to do this? Am I just coming across as like angry face or what's, what's happening? And I got to thinking of how the eyes dilate. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Was that part of the, the approach too? Yeah. I, what I'm trying to make is with your portrait and the portraits for the soul series I'm doing in Southern Illinois is, um, have an authentic feel. They're not beauty shots. They're not glamour shots. They're about real. This is really as, as, as drop your facade and have a real connection with the moment we make the picture. So when the print's there, hopefully people will go into your eyes and feel our connection. Mm -hmm. And when I have you close your eyes and then look up at me, it not only affects your pupil, but it also centers you. Mm -hmm. So if you think about, um, uh, if you see, if you think about a, an NBA player, when they go up to shoot a free throw, they bounce the ball. Sometimes they close their eyes, they say something and then they shoot the hoop. It puts them into a centered spot. So they're centering themselves away from the whole stadium of, 80,000 people wanting them to miss or make, wanting them to make that shot. I do the same thing with photos where I try to get you into my world uh -huh. because for that one two fiftieth of a second, we have a moment. And when that moment is connected, that's when the picture has the energy that I want on the finished print. Mm -hmm. And so there's a variety of things I do with people to get them to forget about their daily life, their, their own agenda. Perhaps if you, if you were like um, a big rock band, you might have your own agenda that you want to communicate with that picture but i want you to communicate my agenda so somewhere we have to come together and that that whole process of walking people through that is to get them to forget about what what they did before they showed up what they're going to do after they show up but to live in the now in this moment when i press the shutter that we're having a moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i thought that was a, a a useful technique because i was also just thinking about when i opened my eyes the eyes dilate I know when uh, you know, I read a lot of, I don't know, psychology and neuroscience, when people fall in love, like the mm -hmm. eyes dilate right. as well. So I'm like, right. oh, this is a pretty, pretty right. useful um, right. um, approach when it comes to making portraits. Right. I also ask people to breathe a lot of times because a lot of times people, if they're tense, they stop breathing. I race motorcycles. And one of the biggest thing when you start racing is you stop breathing because you're so focused on the corner to go fast. And then you, if you don't breathe, you, you're going to crash because you right. don't have your whole physicality into that physical moment. And so um, for me, breathing and that eye connection are two real key aspects of making the picture. Um, so you mentioned uh, it's motocross or is it? I road race primarily, which road is race. where you see guys on road course and their knees <clears throat> on the ground and they're going around. When did this start? I didn't start racing until I was 50. So I've been racing, I guess, 13 years. And this was up in Chicago where you picked all up? over the country. Yeah. I picked up in Chicago. I rode motorcycles since I, you know, I probably, I didn't even start that till later in life, like in my mid thirties. Um, the, one of the, I was doing a photo shoot for the span ministry and one of them showed up on a 69 Ducati and I thought, Oh, that's really cool. I only knew about Harley Davidson's and you know, which are fine, but they weren't really, they didn't really touch my heart, mm -hmm. but this vintage Italian motorcycle really touched my heart and I'm, obsessive compulsive so within two weeks i had a ducati and then six months later I had another one and there was all vintage bikes that i was restoring and because i worked so much i didn't i wanted to i got introduced to racing through the ducati and my friends but because i traveled so much for work i didn't really want to start racing till my daughter went away to college so you know otherwise it'd just be one more thing to take me away from being a dad and so when she went away i raced four races and then i went all in and started doing seasons 
with a group called ARMA, which races all around the country, American Historic Racing Motorcycle Association. So you did this competitively. This wasn't just a... Oh, no, no. Yeah. I'm a six-time national champ. What? Wow. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> but I'm a little obsessive compulsive. Whatever I do, I do big. I mean, I might not be successful at it, but I put everything into it. What about racing? Is it the thrill? Is it the competition? Well, one thing is I like to do things that I have to learn. Um, and not to say that I don't learn making pictures, but I really have a f pretty good understanding of what I want and I can execute it without all, any fear, you could say. So I like to be a little bit on the edge of a disaster. So I like things that are a little bit edgy. And I love uh, racing because I like competition. I like the vintage aspect of the motorcycles. I race both modern and vintage. But there's also a community that's really awesome. And I also had a huge learning curve to catch up with people that have been racing their whole life. It's like now I'm, I'm trying to learn to weld and build sculptures, and it's the same thing. I'm 63. I'm welding with a guy that's 30. He's been doing it his whole life. I've been doing it for a year and a half. So it's, it's, I really like being challenged to grow. I don't want to be comfortable. Um, I like being uncomfortable and finding where that takes me. Because when I'm comfortable, it doesn't seem like I'm as productive as if I'm a little bit on the edge. But racing is, involves a lot of things. There's the competition. There's the physicality of it. It keeps you... Um, fit. If you're racing guys that are 25 and you're old, you got to work out and keep your weight down and blah, blah, blah. So there's lots of aspects. Plus the machines are cool. The, I race on a lot of tracks that I used to watch racing as a kid. So I have a, I'm a very nostalgic person. Even the camera that I'm using for this project is a camera that I always wanted since I was in third grade. I used to ask my parents for it. They'd give me a little picture and say, well, if you work hard, you can buy one someday, but we don't have that kind of money, you know, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I intentionally am using things that I want in this project that have a nostalgic quality as well as a quality because I'm kind of nerdy that way. So vintage motorcycles, vintage cameras. Yes. Yeah, there's vintage everything. There's just so much. My, I'm, I'm competitive as well. Um, I don't have that, that you wouldn't know it, but now I'm like, okay, Paul Illich is racing motorcycles at age 50. I'm, I'm 43 or 44. I don't know. COVID kind of, made it hard for me to calculate the math um now i'm thinking like hmm well, come what, on what, what, what come, can I, come to my house i got tracks in my house <laughs> well, dirt bike tracks we can race dirt bikes i will be like the most novice my wife purchased a, a honda grom uh -huh, uh, yeah yeah those are cool and, um she uh she, we lived down the street um from the boys and girls club and uh we were practicing just riding mm -hmm. in the parking lot I am so uncoordinated. Like I can't get all of my, mm. my both hands and my feet to be doing all these things. So uh, yeah, you're light years ahead of someone like me. It um, just takes practice. I mean, I, I race dirt bikes. I just don't race them as competitive as I do the mm -hmm. asphalt bikes. I've done the uh, thousand mile race in Mexico, the Mexican 1000 off road in the desert and all that stuff. But asphalt bikes are my main thing, but I have dirt tracks at my house and you're welcome to come. And I have bikes in all sizes and we can go ride dirt bikes or you can bring the Grom. It might just get dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll tell April that you know. <laughs> huh. all bikes are good bikes. Cool. That's fun. That's exciting. A mm -hmm. thrill adventure, you know, staying on the edge. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's exciting. And does that, that sure that translates with some of your work that yes. you're doing now too, right? Yeah. Cause I like to put myself in situations that are uncomfortable. And in this project, I'm really doing a portrait survey of everybody in Southern Illinois which is inspired off a project by August Sander did in the 20s in Germany. And if you read about this project, um, it really, if you read about Germany in the 20s and you read about America in the 20s, there's a lot of similarities. And it's almost like a time capsule of sort. And he did a full spectrum of humanity. And in Germany, there was a lot of political upheaval, financial upheaval, social upheaval in the 20s. And we kind of have the same thing going on now. And so I'm not here to... Um, cast judgment on anybody's opinion. I'm here to bring everybody together and put them in, you know, to, to put it into a time capsule. So I really want to photograph every kind of person in South Illinois, left, right, center, every kind of sexuality, every color of skin, every size, and really create a spectrum of humanity. And I put them all in a room and have a, and experience it. I also want to do South Illinois because I think a lot of people, me living most of my life in Chicago, and working a lot in New York and London and all this stuff, you think of a place like Southern Illinois that flyover country is what people would say, and they don't really understand that there's so much life and humanity 
I mean, that you would never expect as exciting. And um, that has to do with um, the cultures, the variety of types of people, the things being produced, whether it be art or music or coal or farming or uh, small businesses, coffee shops. I mean, the coffee we just had here in Marion is amazing. I mean, it's, you know, you would not expect that. And I really want, I'd like this exhibit to travel to try to open people's minds and um, understanding and embrace everybody with love and, and respect. And uh, I photographed so many celebrities in my career. I'm trying to make every person a celebrity in my project. So give them the same respect and the same dignity and authentic communication that, you know, to illustrate who they are and the full spectrum of humanity. That's amazing. And I hope it is. <laughs> I, mean, I, I we'll think see. it is. I, yeah. I, I love when, as a photographer um, um, myself, when you have these chance encounters, um, this past semester, the, our students were photographing the Coin State Fair. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of commercial event photography. Um, they're our client, and we're supposed to just get the shots of people enjoying themselves in the stands as well as the events themselves. Mm -hmm. But there's usually a, a point in time when some of the, uh, the, the, I guess the participants, not participants, but the spectators, they'll notice you have a camera. We had our, our, our little vest on, so we looked official. They would strike up a conversation and say, hey, who are you photographing? Where can I get these images? Then, you know, conversations kind of um, lead to learning their personal history and then, and then they want a portrait of themselves mm -hmm. and conversations still are, are be, um, behold and you know you start to learn a lot more about their history and you go in there assuming uh, people you think you know who people are based on just the surface then when you have those conversations the stories start unfolding and all your um, stereotypes or preconceived notions just washes away and you're like wow this person right. is it's more complicated you were sharing a story uh, um earlier this morning about uh the what's it he was a coal miner yeah yeah, well? yeah 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 you mind uh sharing that with luke yeah well what's interesting was there's a friend of mine that I, i've been doing these sculptures and having some small exhibits at like cedarhurst and there's another uh, museum that I've had some stuff in, and I met this guy named Brandon who has a one-person show right now at that museum. And um, I asked him to photograph him, and I expected to photograph him as a sculptor. And he goes, do you know what I do for a day job? I'm a coal miner. I'm like, holy moly, that's incredible. So I said, I'd actually rather photograph you as a coal miner. Um, and so what I'd like you to do is, you know, let's meet right after you work so you're fully you know, look the part in your gear. And he, he basically does coal mining and then does the sculpture. And of course he's a dad and such, but it's that unexpected connection. So when you see his portrait, it'll, the title will probably be sculptor. And cause the idea of the whole exhibit is to break down your preconceived notions of what people are, because people are so much deeper than you might get from the surface. I photographed a gentleman last week, 94 years old, world war II veteran. He was the flagman when they did the test for the atomic bomb in the Pacific ocean. What? All right. Okay. Here's this guy. I just see at a gallery opening that just a guy, he had a, a world war two hat on. So I thought this guy's got a story, but I didn't know the story was so deep. And the amazing thing about him was everyone has died in his company from cancer, from being so close to the atomic explosion. He's never been sick since he has never even had a cold. He told me this. He said some of his co colleagues died not that long after, and the rest of them died later, but mm -hmm. had very short lives due to the explosion. He had, he told me, fifty-one point five gamma in his body when, you know, after they tested him, and his grand, his kids all said, "Yeah, he never gets sick." I mean, you just go. I mean, beyond being a a, a soldier in World War Two, which is a Amazing that he's still around right. to be right to actually witness an atomic bomb. I don't know anybody that's, I'm, I've met lots of people from around the world that are high flying type people, but no, it's the first person I've met that's seen an atomic bomb explosion and has lived that long. And has lived that long, 94 years old. So, I mean, the cool thing about photography um, is it. I feel like I have diplomatic immunity when I have a camera in my hand, which means I can talk to anybody and feel confident because I have a purpose. 
if I'm just at a, walking down the street, I'm not going to talk to anybody because I'm kind of an inward person. But with a camera, I'm totally want to engage with everybody. And I don't have, in it, in it, this opens the door to conversation. And that's what I want the exhibit to be is open the door to conversations among all the different kinds of people, all the types of people that think differently, look differently, act differently, and put it all together and give everybody equitable space. And, um, but it's amazing what you learn when you're doing a project that you mm -hmm. pull into town and you might have a preconceived no notion of like this guy is an artist, sculptor, but he's actually a coal miner too. And it's like people have so many layers like an onion, you just keep peeling them back and there's just so many insightful things and stories. And I, I want this to kind of be like a time capsule also of this time period. So hopefully 100 years from now, some of these people I photograph, their occupations won't even exist and people have to go, well, what is that? You know, so. That's the, uh, you know, the capturing an image, that moment, you know, is preserved and that mm -hmm. story, you know, is, you know, can be told for, gosh, how, for hundreds of years, yep. could, you know, potentially. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So how did you, going back a little bit, uh, in Chicago, mm -hmm. so you did from these bands, Smashing Pumpkins, to Oprah. What do you attribute you getting in the door? Was it having a camera? How did you How did you make those connections? How did you <clears throat> reach that? Was it? Well, I'm obsessive compulsive. Like I started racing when I'm 50, and I'm still racing in a national series, right? So whenever I do something, I give it a 110, 120 degree focus. Ever since I was in third grade, I wanted to be a photographer. And I also wanted to make pictures and not take pictures. So I really wanted to get, have things that were more of a vision come to life, not just click pictures like a journalist. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. That's just not my jam. I really wanted to have a point of view and get it. So initially I came out of Carbondale, had 200 bucks in my pocket, moved to Chicago, which didn't get me very far. Couldn't even get an apartment. I was very blessed that a friend of mine's parents were uh, professors at Northwestern and were going on a sabbatical to Israel. And they let me stay at their house for three months for free if I just mowed the lawn and took care of things. And I was able to get a job. And I was very strategic with who I wanted to work for. So I wanted to work for photographers that were doing work that I felt was um, beyond advertising or beyond commission work, but it could hang in a gallery. So if you, the famous ones you can think of are like Avedon, Irving Penn, people that do commission work, but also are in museum collections. So in Chicago, the main photographer I wanted to work for was a guy named Mark Hauser, who at the time was the biggest portrait photographer going in the Midwest and maybe even the country. And so it took me two and a half years to get the job with Mark. But once I was there, that I really gave it my all. And so working with a photographer like that, I was in the stratosphere of photographing, you know, Michael Jordan or, you know, big bands and, you know, he, we shot for Rolling Stone and all the magazines. And so that kind of laid the groundwork to understand how that works. Because it's one thing to make pictures, but how do you do the business side of it? How do you meet people? How do you, what do you, what do you, what do you do to brand yourself and things like this? So Mark really taught me how to um, be who I was and put it into pictures and get it in front of people. And so the, the really cool thing about Mark was he, a lot of people that are in the creative are very paranoid about people, you know, um, whatever, stealing ideas or stealing clients or whatever. Mark was very confident. He had no reason to fear things. Mm -hmm. So, um, I just quit and went on my own and he got a um, job with John Mellencamp to shoot the album Scarecrow. And so he goes, why don't you come with me? You'll shoot, I'll shoot. So some of the pictures on the back of that album are mine. And then uh, I, I went to do that kind of like, kind of, we. T I helped him as an assistant, but I also got to photograph it. And then um, Mark went to China for a job and Mellencamp needed a tour book. So Mark goes, oh, just have Paul do it. He's you know, so I went and so I went from like zero to go. So I was shooting a multi platinum artist doing the tour book. It's because of Mark, he opened a lot of doors because with his certification and a lot of those people knew who I was because I worked really hard for him. And so people recognized that. And um, that opened up a lot of doors. And then, of course, you have to make the pictures to make it happen, you know. And so uh, I have to say, a lot of my early career had was because I assisted the right people that had gave me the opportunity to perform and then recommended me. And then I'd go to New York every six months and show my work to Rolling Stone and spin and try to get in the door. And I was always sending pictures to people. I was going to places to meet people. You know, I would just like, you know, I'd go to concerts, I'd go to gallery openings. I, I was just everywhere all the time. I, I don't need to sleep. I'm a, I'm a person that can operate on very little sleep. So I was going a hundred miles an hour as a younger person. And then, 
one picture gets another picture and then another picture. And then I was really lucky that, you know, I started out in 85 and was hitting my stride about 1990. As far as when I say hitting my stride, like the business was really rolling. You know, I was, it was doing good. And then that um, sort of blended with the, the music scene in Chicago, the Wax Tracks record, you know, these bands like, um, you know, came from Chicago, started getting big, like Ministry and Revolting Cox and My Life with a Thrill Kill Cult and then Smashing Pumpkins and then blah, 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 blah. And then so then the magazines already knew who I was because I was in New York, so I started shooting for them and then those jobs got me jobs with like Weezer or whoever and it just it just sort of built up to I did my first rock video. It became a heavy rotation on MTV and then I was getting fl flown to London to direct things and people didn't even know I was a photographer. They thought I was a director, which I would guess I was, but I didn't know it myself. You know, I just had done one and it became successful. So I guess what I want to say is that I had a strategy. I worked hard and I was really lucky that it all worked out. The, the endorsements came. Pe yeah. People recognized that yeah. work ethic and yeah. the quality of work. And you know, yeah. there's, there's a lot to be said about that. You know, you, you went through the, uh, uh, photo program at SIU and it's, it's kind of remarkable you know I've I'm in that position as a professor at, at SIU photo and I, I tell my students all the time like it's uh, referrals endorsements but you I mean those are opportunities uh, but you have to deliver um, yes you have to have level of professionalism um, a strategy you just can't just stroll in and yeah. expect the world to give it all to you actually have yeah. to earn it yeah there's a certain degree of excellence like if you'll notice um like there's a movie that just um went on apple streaming and amazon streaming called uh, love charlie which is a chef named charlie trotter and i'm the associate producer on it and a lot of the film and the photos in that movie are my images and charlie trotter was a chef that started like vegetarian menus and farm to table i mean just going on he's the guy that started all that 20, 30 years ago. And uh, the chefs that worked for him are now the world's greatest chefs. And unfortunately he's passed away, but I worked on a bunch of books with him and the whole, th when I would come in and I brought in my crew and if there was somebody he didn't know, he'd say, Paul, does he know what excellence is or she know what excellence is? And I said, I wouldn't bring anybody in here that didn't know what excellence was because he didn't want anybody around him that wasn't focused on being excellent. And so that's how most people, whether you're the CEO of a giant corporation you're a famous chef, you're a rock star. There's a certain degree when you are, you know, NBA player, you are at the top of your game. You surround yourself with other people that are top of the game. And that goes all the way down to the photo assistant or the every, every aspect. Because if something goes wrong, you know, it's my fault mm -hmm. whether somebody else did or not. So you, they, people want to know that the, their time is valuable and whatever time they're giving you is going to be something good's going to come of it. And, I, and it's likewise, they recognize the crew people that work for me had that quality. So I could do the same thing with people that work for me. And I have where I said that, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that woman or man, you know, give them a chance because I can't do it, you know, and, but you can't, you get the opportunity, but you have to make it happen. And that comes from, you know, just being ready. Mm -hmm. I guess it's like, I always tell people, people don't pay me by the hour because most time I'm photographing the cover of a magazine. I might get 10 minutes they're paying me for the 50 years or whatever that got me to the point that I can photograph this person and put them on the cover of Time Magazine and have 10 minutes to do it, you know, or two minutes or whatever. And so you're really paid for your whole life experience that brings you to that point. And that's why teaching the students at Carbondale, that's something that I understood when I was in school. Mm -hmm. that it, you have to be prepared for that moment when the moment happens because you never know. And so you have to go beyond just making pictures. It's about conversation. It's about your professionalism, your business skills, everything. It's a whole package. Mm -hmm. There's a saying that uh, where preparation meets opportunity, success can happen. Exactly. And for any students, you know, that, or anybody listening that would maybe want to break into a professional photography career, is there a piece of advice that you learned at that early stage that you would say, this is something that you need to do or that you need to know to make it happen? I think no matter what you're doing, whether it's music, photography, painting, sculpture, business, it's being yourself, accepting who you are, the good, the bad, and everything in between, and understanding how to access your history and put it into the work that needs to be done. 
Uh, so what I'm trying to say is you have to find the relatable moment from your life that relates to the work you're doing that is truly yourself. So that work that you do is individual, unique, by the very definition that it came from you. And even if you're a twin and you grew up in the same household, you don't have the same, you don't see the situation in the same way. And that twin's going to have a different point of view than your twin. I'm not a twin, but I have a point of view that I'm able to put into the work because I've examined my life and I've accepted my good and my bad. And I know when to pull from what to make the image that I want to make. And I think being yourself is the hardest thing anybody can do because then when you get criticized, it hurts the most. And if you talk to anybody that's successful, business, art, they've, they've put themselves into the work. And uh, the big thing nowadays is work-life balance. Mm-hmm. That doesn't exist if you're successful because your whole life is your work. You might have some balance with your time, but if you don't put your whole life into the work, I'm not talking 24 hours a day, but your whole life from inside and you exposed your most vulnerable self into your work, it's hard to stand out from the millions of people. Even now it's even harder because of Instagram and all this stuff. There's even more creators than when I started out. But the only way you're going to stand out is not to be to rely on technical things, but the emotion of who you are and put it into the work. That probably was long winded. So, <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like uh, for you, the, the whole work life balance um, is work even a concept for you or is it like a life is a concept or, or play is play is a good substitution. Like you're, you're not working. You're, you're, you're playing. Um, yeah. I'm just living my life and, and pushing the limits with everything I do. And I, my life is happens to be in my work, but I wouldn't say it's work because I love what I do. And if I didn't love it, then it wouldn't come out the way it comes out. And when you don't love it, it looks like you don't love it. And if you're not giving 120% of who you are, it's obvious. I mean, so, uh, yeah, I think it's life and play. It's mm-hmm. not work-life balance. It's just doing my thing. Yeah, I try, to, I try to get the students to understand that concept. When students kind of feel burned out and assignments, whether they're photography assignments or other coursework, like the moment you have that mindset of understanding what you're doing as work, like drudgery, like it's game over. Like you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're trying to dig yourself out of that yep. very negative mindset. Like if you can reframe your um, mindset to understand it as play, like actually there, there's joy in all these activities, whether they may not be your cup of tea, but if you can understand there's something to learn, something, realize that you're growing. Right. Um, Find the connection. Um, in motorcycle racing, there's two things. Where you look is where you go. Okay, for me, if you're racing and you're a knee on the ground and a bike crashes and you look at the crash, you're going to drive right to the crash and run over it. But So you have to look at your line, no matter what chaos is going on, where you look is where you go. And it's a metaphor for life, really. Where you look, if you look towards the light, you're going to end up in the light. If you look for darkness, you're going to end up in the darkness. If you focus on the negative, all those negative things are going to come to you. So what you put the most energy in, the most focus is what you draw into your life. Um, I 100% believe that has helped me so much since I was a little kid because I sort of learned that from my family before I even got into motorcycles is that you focus on what you want the most and you try to get out of your mind any negative and dark things because that's what you're going to draw into. You're going to be like a magnet. I was, My dad always used to say it was like a radio station and you're in the static and then when you tune it in, you hear it clearly. So you have to find where you're tuned in mm-hmm. and then execute it. But I really believe in where you work, where you look is where you go. And then the other thing is, Smooth is fast, fast is smooth. So when you're like really aggressive on a throttle, not to mean that you aren't going with, with intention as hard as you can, but you're smooth. Because if you're a herky-jerky, the bike starts getting out of control and you crash. And the same thing in life. If you are smooth, smooth is fast, fast is smooth. And if you focus on the goodness, not the darkness, and you're smooth with your transitions, things just happen. Mm-hmm. But when you're like erratic, or you don't believe in yourself, or you have self-doubt, or you're trying to be something you're not, you know, that's when everything goes wrong. So, in my opinion. No, that's, <laughs> you're saying a lot of things. I've, I've, I've heard, uh, you know, CrossFitters say that same thing, smooth as fast. Because uh, injuries happen yep. when you're trying to show off, or yep. like you just use brute strength and not yep. using uh, the right uh, movements. And um, 
what you said about the the uh, taking those turns. Yep. Um, I think that's where I went wrong. Um, well, my mountain bike, I was same thing. I've I've wrecked because I wasn't. I got distracted. Yeah, you look at the tree and then mm-hmm. you hit the tree, mm-hmm. but you have to focus. And it tells you when it's really gnarly. You're riding a dirt bike and you're going over these rocks or mountain bikes. You, you got to look at the line and stay. Fi- and it's not necessarily the line that other people took. Mm-hmm. That's another thing that's important. You have to cause your sometimes make your own pathway, and that's how to be who you are. You carve your own path. And the same thing when you're off road mountain biking or motorcycling, the rut that you see as the line might not be the best line. That's just what the masses went for. Mm-hmm. And generally where the masses go isn't always the best. With motorcycling and mountain biking, you're looking for traction. Traction is where you want to be, and the traction changes. And just like in life, the traction changes. And you have to know where you are in your life and find the traction to take you to wherever you want to go. Um, but when you focus on that thing that's scaring you, mm-hmm. that's where you end up. Mm-hmm. So you got to get your eyes off that. And it's a hard skill to learn is to stay in your line. And when you're racing elbow to elbow, going super fast, you learn to trust people that hold their lines. And people that don't, you know, they're going to crash and burn. You don't want to be near them. And fortunately, the guys at the front are all holding their lines. So you can race elbow to elbow and feel like they're not going to take you out because they want to win. And in order to win, you have to finish. (laughs) So (laughs) definitely having earlier conversations with you this morning you even like just showing me your equipment the Haas of blood with mm-hmm. the, the digital, digital back it's obvious that you you know your line in terms of uh, technique and mm-hmm. uh, materials the the tools of the trade even that you uh kept that uh the old tripod uh, mm-hmm. legs like when you came out and you pulled out that tripod i was like okay this is this is a person that has um total faith in equipment that has lasted years and years and you know you you also pivoted when new technology mm-hmm. with digital photography but you're still um at least with with this work mm-hmm. uh, combining the vintage with the new yep i feel like you have definitely uh have been you know your line so well that the end results um give us something new um, and I think it's going to be a very attractive for, uh, viewers who may be unfamiliar with your work. Um, I, I can't wait to see what these portraits are going to, uh, uh, look like, whether they're in, hanging on the museum or in the book. Um, just hearing your philosophy, um, in life as well as how it crossovers in photography, um, is really giving me, uh, more appreciation for the, uh, the approach um, you have in the creative process. So I just want to say thank you for like sharing all of this. <laughs> I know we, we still have many more minutes to go through, but I definitely want to uh, express well, that before we... Uh, you're very welcome. You'll also notice that I didn't show up with a bunch of lenses and yeah, five, yeah. you know, like a big, huge bag of choices. I, I am a firm believer that you edit before you take the picture. So I show up with exactly what... I've already edited what I'm doing before I showed up. So I, all I need is one lens, one camera, and a tripod or whatever I need for that, you know, project. Cause I know what I want. And like, I used to do these four by five projects in Italy and I'd have one deer door, three of the exact same lenses. So if one broke, I just could go to the next one. It wasn't cause I needed extra lenses. I'd had them because of their vintage and they often the shutters would go. Mm-hmm. So I always have several of the same thing, but I don't need, I don't, I find the less you have, the more you can focus on creativity and connection. Mm-hmm. If I'm focusing on gear and technology, then I can't focus on that connection with people. And so I live pretty simply. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't know what to expect. You know, uh, I uh, became part of the SIU photo community in 2005. You have a long past. And like, you know, I've, I've heard of your name and Dan Overturf would, uh, at times, uh, take some of his students up to Chicago and uh, students would come back and uh, remark about uh, uh, the studio visit. So you're kind of like this l- legacy, this legend. Um, um, at our program. So it was really quite an honor to have uh, uh, you in my presence pointing the camera at me and being able to see like your your approach. Um, that was definitely, I feel like I was in the classroom while watching you observing hmm. how you uh, um, uh, made this uh, portrait of myself. You know, I, I this may be a, another question. I'm sure uh, some of the viewers may be asking about this uh, uh, Southern Illinois portrait series. 
So when we uh, connected, um, I had asked like, well, what, uh, what should I bring? Uh, what should I wear with locations? Like uh, in, I recall you're like, it's natural light. There's not going to be a huge production. And you know, it was um, pretty simple. Um, but I did give some thought on, on my background and with the Swamp Fox, I definitely, uh, that's a new, uh, uh, venture for, for me on the creative, uh, process. Street art is not something I'm been doing for long. I mean, Luke gave me the opportunity and our students to do it, but, um, trying to get back to my train of thought here. Um, what you have, uh, did in that short 10 minutes. I'm not sure if that we even went 10 minutes. Um, that was quite a learning experience. I'm definitely going to uh, share with my students about that, the simplicity of it, the simple directions of closing the eyes, the small movements. I was always chin down, chin down, and just smallest mm -hmm. the millimeters yep. um, make a huge difference telling me to soften, mm -hmm. which I assumed was like, okay, maybe I'm too serious. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put a nice little mm -hmm. slight smile on the face. Um, I wish I had a recording of you um, directing <laughs> me just so my students right. could understand like how the smallest movements make the biggest. So I know with uh, most beginning uh, photographers when they're learning, they're just trying to learn how right. to operate the equipment. Right. You know, they have a plethora of tools at their disposal. Right. And you definitely want the students to have access to as many tools when they're learning just so they kind right. of know yeah. what what is their uh, vision. Certainly. But definitely being able to interact with people and put them at ease, being able to pose and get those mm -hmm. gestures that you want. Um, I'm sure someone as you has been doing this for a long time, you you know when the portrait is at its peak mm -hmm. um, based on those uh, right. small compositional uh, decisions. Um, so I guess what I'm saying here is like, that was a, a, a learning experience that was uh, uh, immensely uh, appreciated. And I just want to let you know, I'm going to pass it on to, Good. to my students. Pass it on. Yeah, it's great to hear that. I appreciate you sharing that. I mean, when I do jobs, I might have 30 people on a set, lights, camera, you know, depending on what I'm doing, some could light, I could light the whole thing up if I wanted and bring, I could bring assistants and producers and we could have all this stuff. But sort of the point of this project is to take it back to when I was in Carbondale. And it was me with a camera. And then when I do a project, I create what I call a box. I find that I'm more creative when you make walls and you don't have every option. So I intentionally have no lights. I have no fill card. I have one camera, one lens, and a tripod. And I intentionally, those are the rules. I can't shoot with anything that isn't in the environment. And I try to come to the place and just make it happen on how I feel and how I might connect with the individual. And I want everything to be as authentic as possible as, and um, with that connection. And, and I can be more creative than if I had brought an Octobank and four pro photo set and three assistants and a stylist and hair and makeup and wardrobe, mm -hmm. and, which I might do for a job. And that's what people expect. And they want a little more of a show, you could say. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I could shoot lots of pictures and you know do all this stuff because there's a certain performative aspect of doing what I do. But in this case, I know what I want and I can do it very quickly because I know exactly what I'm going for. And it's very simple. And the real connection is when we have that moment mm -hmm. and boom, that will change to a different kind of thing. And, and I usually shoot three or four different variations just because I like to take pictures, but I already have what I know. I have enough on the first setup, but maybe something better comes along. Um, but it's the hardest thing to do as a creative person is to work minimally because you could hide behind all the gear and the pomp and circumstances and, you know, all the cameras and lenses and digital and Photoshop and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so the hardest thing for me, the greatest uh, degree of difficulty is to make it with the most simple way. And that's why I like doing it because I like it to be difficult. It's been a very big challenge for me to work by myself. Mm -hmm. I haven't worked by myself in 30 years. I usually have at least one assistant with me. Even when I went to go to Italy and do a project for myself, I brought you know, one person with me to help me do whatever. And it's been a huge adjustment because I have to like really engage every aspect of my thinking, technical and the conversation. But usually it, the crew takes care of, they know what I want. 
I just had to focus on the person. Mm -hmm. And now I'm doing everything. But it's really been in, incredible to go and photograph like I'm a student at Carbondale, which is me and a camera. And I love it. I love that simplicity. That's awesome. Yeah. And again, making it uh, uncomfortable, maybe. Mm -hmm. you, you're used to yes. having big crew, big yep. show, yep. but yep. taking that away. Yep. Seeking that discomfort again. Right. Challenging myself to go to the, you know, go someplace I haven't gone in a long time. And I know you mentioned somebody, an advice would be to put your true self into the work. Yes. How does one find that? What would you recommend to a young person, student, myself, anybody looking to find their true self to be able to put that into the work? Well, first of all, you have to practice it in everyday life. You have to be honest with yourself and understand who you are really and what your personal limitations are and where you're going to ride the edge of uh, disaster within yourself, not other people's expectations. And the hardest thing to do is to, um, can I swear on this? Yeah. Okay. I believe that you need to create a body of work that I would call your fuck you portfolio, which basically is this is who I am. If you don't like it, fuck off to be bold. And that's inappropriate, but that's just the best way to get to the point fast. So you need to do work that you can believe in. And it doesn't matter if anybody else cares to the point that it becomes, could, you could say something vulgar like that. And you have to be willing to take the consequences of that. So when you're your true self, there's consequences because you're not necessarily hauling the norm, right? And the consequences could be you could be censored, you could be canceled in the modern world, you could be whatever, but that's your true self and you need to live it because that true self, no one else is like that. And in the whole world, not your brother, your sister, your twin, your best friend, no one is who you are. And so you have to be willing to put it on the line and take the criticism that goes along with that and not in be afraid of it because what I learned is when somebody says really great stuff to me, it's just a suspect as when they say horrible things to me. You have to sort of filter it and go, what does that really mean? Is there something to learn from this? Or is that person just buttering me up because they want something? Mm -hmm. And they're saying, oh man, you're so amazing. Or, and when they're saying something horrible, about it, are they just jealous? Or is that really good criticism? It could be. It could be that it is horrible, but you have to sort of think about it. You can't just be excited. You can't just listen to it there's a filtering process to get to the point. And you have to be willing to not take things personally when people say things that are really horrible or really good and not get too excited or too depressed. You have to sort of say in the zone um, or the flow, some people say. Um, I photographed a psychiatrist, psychologist from the University of Chicago. Uh, I can't pronounce his name. He, he wrote the book called Flow, like in the 90s. And mm -hmm. it's basically like once you're in that zone, um, Mik Mikhail starts with a C. It's a really long name. I'm sorry, I'm not good at words. But when you're in that flow, you feel it. And it doesn't matter what anybody thinks because you're in the flow and you feel so good, you just want to repeat it. But the consequences kind of happen once you hang it on the wall or you deliver it and people hate it or they love it. You have to deal with how to come to terms with that. But you can't be afraid of it. And I would rather be driving a cab in Chicago and doing my own thing than doing somebody else's thing and making a million dollars. Now, and if you truly do your own thing, you might make a million dollars or me, you might not. That's really not the point, but you're going to be happy and the work's going to be more significant. Um, so I think a lot of social pressures these days with um, your social media, Instagram, things, the blingy things get more likes because it's like, woo, shiny, shiny, blingy, you know, and the really deep things take a lot more ponderance. And I would say like, it's kind of like when you listen to music, most of the great records and songs, you're not going to like the first time you heard it. You might have to hear it five or 10 times to kind of like understand what you're hearing and find your emotional connection with that. Where the blingy pop song, oh yeah, that's great. Yep, you know, but two months later, you don't care because it's like, it, there's nothing there to keep growing. And that's how great work is. And the great work takes chances and you ride the edge of disaster to get the greatness, just like in racing. Um, in, when I teach workshops, I tell one of my things I say is gas, no brakes. Because when you have the gas on, you have control. As soon as you hit the brakes, you're out of control, whether you're on a motorcycle or in a car, because suddenly the, it's unstable. And your gas, everything is working. And so you really, you need to use brakes, but very minimally and at the right time. 
And in life, the more you can give it gas and just believe in yourself and accept the consequences and not take things personally, you'll find so much more happiness. And in the end, more than likely, you'll produce better work. And the authenticity that you're reaching for, right. trying to convey in exactly. your point of view exactly. into the work. Yeah. Just, just hearing that, I'm, I'm just thinking of previous uh, experiences with the gatekeepers of like the fine art photography mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had to uh, endure the same experience of going to like um, portfolio reviews, like at mm -hmm. Foto, Foto Nola or uh, Atlanta Celebrates Photography. No, there's all your major cities have like right. a major portfolio review. And I've gone to a few um, in New Orleans or Houston. And I remember showing work that wasn't what was trending. Mm -hmm. my, my work is very experimental and um, I can relate to making work that really captures an authentic moment. And I remember uh, one of the gatekeepers, I won't say their name, um, she had preconceived notions of who I was and what, what my work was about. It was um, the cage fighting series, How to Hug and Other Sublimations of Men. And she really kind of pinned me as a heter um, heterosexual man who's just photographing, I guess, barbaric men just fighting in the cage. And, and the images, you know, they're sports photography, but there's more, more to it. And I was trying to make my case and, you know, give the elevator pitch to her. And she was just so dismissive of me. Mm -hmm. And she was saying like, well, if you want this work to sell, you're going to have to sell it to uh, um, gay men. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And also you need to um, identify as gay. And I'm like, and this, this is a, um, a lesbian um, mm -hmm. um, critic, mm -hmm. and you know she she can make careers because mm -hmm. she has that uh, yep. um, experience. Yep. And I was just blown away by that. Yep. And I was like, no, that that's going to get me canceled. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. If I um, misidentify just to make a sale. Yeah. Um, but it, but it's it's that's kind of speaking to the commercialization of the art world. Because the art world wants to, um, I mean, think about it. Until recently, most people in museums were white males. And most curators were white males. Now most curators aren't because it's not the trend to have white males. You want to have um, people with different sexuality and different ethnic, you know, which is awesome, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, now it's going back to like the reverse where mm -hmm. if you're, if, you know, she's... You're a, a male that's straight, and she wants to make you gay to, in order to have that work sell. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like the same disingenuousness of, you know, of everything. It's ridiculous, but that is the art world. In my opinion, the art world is just as commercial as the commercial world. Mm -hmm. The commercial world is just more honest about it because you're doing this to sell this product. But the art world is the same way, and I don't want to offend anybody in that world. But that's just my opinion, and there's nothing wrong with it. There's always going to be gatekeepers, and those gatekeepers are going to. Even if they give you a show, they're going to decide what they have think is the best for the show that's going to be best for the museum mm -hmm. and the people coming to the museum more than what, maybe what the message of your show is. There's always going to be curating, and it's not always the purest form of what I would consider art. But that's just the way the world is. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just how it is. But to think that there's a purity, like I once I had an assistant come up to and he actually went to school in Carbondale mm -hmm. and he worked for me for a little bit and he really hated the experience and he, he gave me a, a point of view and how I was a prostitute and all this mm -hmm. stuff. And I said, huh, oh, let's, let's just, this is back in CD, so let's just talk about prostitution. Do you like Robert Frank? Oh yeah, do you think he's a prostitute? No, well, here's a Rolling Stone record that Robert Frank did. Do you like Michael Kenna? Oh, here's a record cover Michael Kenna did. Do you like, you know, I just named up all these Heroes. Yeah. Heroes of art photography. And, oh, here's an album cover. And I knew, because I have a photographic, I'm not the smartest guy. In fact, I'm not smart at all, but I have a photographic memory for artwork and locations, and I can remember who did what and mm -hmm. what. And so the guy was like, I said, but good luck with whatever you're going to do, because, you know, it does, just because you sell something doesn't mean it's wrong or makes it less valuable. There's always going to be somebody that's going to help um guide or curate whatever you're doing, whether it's an art show or a commercial assignment. 
But if you can find purity within yourself, you can feel, feel good about yourself and the work you do, whether anybody cares about it or not, because that's, in the end, what it's all about for me. Mm-hmm. And I've been lucky that I've been accepted and I've had success, but it's really about finding where the people connect. Now, I don't know if it would work for me nowadays because the world's a different place, but the way I, in my coming up, it worked out nice and it might have not worked out five years earlier or five years later because a lot of it's, there's a lot of luck involved in all of this. Mm-hmm. Even if you work hard, like I noticed, I sometimes shot bands for, I, I shot this band Weezer. Never heard of them. They said, hey, you want to go to the show tonight? I said, oh, sure. They gave us passes, me and Leisha went. I'm like, holy crap. They were like the backup to the backup to the backup. We're like, holy crap. These guys are amazing. And like two weeks later, they're everywhere. You know, and I've shot bands for Rolling Stone that were the same. And I never heard of them again. You know, because part of it's timing. You know, it's like, you can still be an awesome musician. And they're still going 20 some years later. You know, but other bands wouldn't last two months later because Mm -hmm. whatever they are doing and the time and the feel and the politics and whatever, it just was working. And and that's not to to say anybody's less or anybody's more. It's just how it works out. The, uh, the gatekeepers in the fine art photography world, like you had mentioned, like being true to yourself, know your basically vision, you know, no, I struggle with that because, you know, you, we live in this world where the more likes, Mm-hmm. This becomes currency. Yeah. Um, so when you receive criticisms of what's marketable, what's sellable, what's um, displayable in blue chip galleries or mm-hmm. museums, you know, I, a lot of times I found myself like pivoting, like, okay, this work isn't being accepted. Like, it's it's maybe too different. So I'm like, okay, maybe I need to like um, make work that is uh, in line with others, but I find myself like, I last maybe a month making work that is what's in vogue. And I always just find myself deterring back to a- uh, Which is which is awesome. Mm-hmm. I believe that's what you ought to be because I always tell people like, even at a museum level, and I'm listening to the podcast right now, I gotta find the name of it. Well, I turned my phone off. So sound. But there's a museum. There's a there's a podcast I'm listening to, and, and the woman's a former curator of um, the museum in Los Angeles, and it's about this these two sculptors that live together, and one the woman died, and and she thinks that the guy killed him, but he's this famous sculptor, and blah blah. It's very interesting. Anyway, in the last episode, she's talking to another curator who left her job in Indiana because she wanted to buy this piece of work, and a very wealthy trustee guy went off on this sort of racist slant, and. Um, so she quit over it, which people just don't do. And she walked out of the room with this wealthy benefactor. So you add that layer into what's liked. It's not just what the curator likes, but who's the person with the money that's paying for the show that likes, you know what I mean? That, mm-hmm. that sort of is the, another gatekeeper. So you have multiple gatekeepers. So that's why you can only be true to yourself because you aren't in control of all the ways people are going to say no. Mm-hmm. But you, are, can, can, you can, are in control of saying yes to yourself. And you just have to accept the fact that you may work at a tea house or you may be a celebrated artist. It, it doesn't matter if the work is what you want to do, you should have happiness. And that happiness of working at a job, making $15 an hour or $10 an hour or $2 an hour isn't going to change if you're doing crappy work and you're making $1,000 an hour. But if you're doing great work and you're making that, it's great. But if you're doing what really fulfills you, the money will doesn't matter. You will, because you will have love and genuine in your heart and you'll attract good people in your life and you'll just be a happier person. I mean, it sounds very idealized, but I truly believe it. Mm-hmm. The I mean, art it, of owning it. I mean, it takes a while to find people who have similar interests and belief. Um, I mean, they're going to be strangers, but if the strangers also are attracted to your worldview, your philosophy, it does tend to blossom organically i guess the more sincere living a sincere and authentic vulnerable life definitely is a uh, it's a strength uh, i think uh maybe some creatives don't dedicate a hundred percent um to they may try to follow the the currency of likes on social media yeah which i think is ridiculous i really just think you need to be yourself and be fearless i mean i've i have worked with some major 
wealthy, powerful people. And I've told them what I thought. You know, when they asked me my opinion about what we're doing, why are we doing it, what they're wearing, the light, everything. And I can tell them exactly everything. And they're like, okay. But if you hesitate, they're going to eat you alive and you're mm. going to end up on their path. But if you believe in it, and then they end up believing in you, they're going to allow you to do your thing because they realize that you have a point of view and that you have a vision and we're going down the same page of excellence and um, not being afraid of them because of their power structure, you know, the power structure of their position or their wealth or whatever it is. Um, everybody else says yes to them no matter what they say because they're afraid of them. But if you're not afraid and you're willing to get fired, you'll do great. But you have to be willing to get fired and you know, accept that as part of the thing. I, I remember my first time, like the fifth time I photographed Charlie Trotter um, before I ever did a book for him and I won the James Beard Award working for him and all this stuff. But before that ever happened, he gave me like an art history test and he asked me about all these contemporary photographers and what my opinion was of them. And I thought to myself, well, you know, he gets photographed by all the big magazines. He may be friends with these people. And I told him the honest truth of what my opinion of these, this photographer, that photographer, this painter, whatever, you know, whether I thought they were good and why I thought they were good or why I thought they were full of shit. And I thought to myself, well, this is either going to make me bond with him or he's going to throw me out of here. I already have my photo, so I'm just going to tell him the truth. And we bonded because we had the same opinion on creativity and who was just bling and who was actually doing work. And we built an incredible relationship. So I've always, I always trust myself, even knowing that I may get fired at any moment from that project. But if I trust myself, I have no one to blame because I'm just being myself. Mm -hmm. If I try to be somebody else, then I get fired. I'm like, oh, that was stupid. I wasn't even being myself. I wasn't being true. Mm -hmm. So I can live with it because I'm just being myself. And so I, uh, I don't know how I got on that point, but I think it's just trying to stick to your guns and be who you are and not follow likes and not follow trends and just do what's inside your heart and feel like, that's why I kind of really like outsider art because it's art that is being done because someone just feels it and has to do it. They didn't go get an MFA. They didn't go to college. Like I went to college. They're doing it because they have to get this off their, their plate. And um, I want to have that kind of aesthetic, even though I'm an educated, you know, perceived educated person in this right. world of created, but I want to have that rawness that I had when I was, you know, in first grade. Hmm. That's, that's sometimes that's 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 hard because you have like a the, a whole life work experience or play experience in the commercial mainstream mm -hmm. like so i i guess this speaks to like why you give yourself this self-constraint of keep it minimal with your the camera in natural light because that's that's pretty uh no bells and whistles are going to be used uh, yeah to help i guess not be too overly snazzy or high production so yeah that that makes sense but it's hard it's hard to strip completely um that commercial experience yeah and it's the easiest way to strip it is to get as little people and technology around mm -hmm. did you ever hear of a professor who's passed away named harold grosowski mm -hmm. he was a professor at siu and he taught a general studies design uh, pro uh class and the first day of class, this was a general, like it was at Lawson. Is that a hall still? Mm -hmm. Yep. So you know this hall, it's like 150 people or whatever. And he says, you, you know, first day of class, this class is about getting rid of everything you've learned since before you came to kindergarten. And hopefully when you leave this class, you'll be back to zero so you can think freely, creatively, and clearly. But I'm going to try to get all the rules out of your head so you think like yourself. And I was like, holy crap. And it was the most amazing class. And I have since tried to research to see if he ever had a book. I mean, there's no. It doesn't. No, I need that. I cannot every, find any information on him. And maybe because you teach at, at Carbondale, you could see if there's any legacy or even his, um, his uh, what do you call it when you do a, uh, the class? Uh, evaluations? No, not evaluation, but the program for the class like your. Uh, Assessment? No, like a syllabus. When, a syllabus, yeah. Oh. If there's like even a syllabus, it would trigger some of the exercises that we went through. But um, that class, that did it. That class changed my life. And also in the design department, I took another class, and I forget what it was, but it was, they basically gave you a problem and they gave you 30 minutes to solve it. It was like, I remember the first one was that they gave you a, a cherry tomato, a piece of paper, and two inches of tape, and then like 40 minutes, we're going to drop the sandbag on that tomato. You need to save the tomato with this piece of paper. And 
every class was like that. And it was co- really, comp- I'm very competitive, so I had, I want to win, but you have to think freely and want to win, right? Mm-hmm. But it was really good for unlocking original thinking in your brain. Yeah, it definitely strips away the the checkbox list. I find, I have experience with some students that they want, essentially want to know what the clear directives and solutions are so they can you're right i've had that where people just tell me i teach workshops and they'll say just tell me how to make a successful picture and i'll make it i said you have to tell yourself what that is Mm -hmm. i can tell you how i do it but that's not going to give you success because that's going to be you're just going to make my picture and that picture's already been made and for you to really be successful you have to find it within yourself and i'm here to help you unlock that but it's a journey is you have to take the chance and the risk and put the effort in because otherwise you're just copying me. And I could easily tell you how to copy me, but that's boring. I've already done it. And mm-hmm. people are going to say, oh, you look like that guy's photography. Why do we need you? So uh, it's, but I understand that mentality. A lot of people, that's when you really don't understand how much you have to put yourself into the work. You just want to be told step one, step two, step three, step four. You know, mm-hmm. it's like a tutorial. Yeah. And that doesn't do anything that's memorable. It might make you good, but it won't make you great. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a valid point. It speaks to one of my favorite quotes from Yoda in Star Wars. Uh, you must unlearn what you have learned. Exactly. I didn't know that. I've never watched Star Wars, <laughs> but now I might want to. Luke Skywalker is going through the training of yep. becoming a Jedi. Yep. And he yep. has to strip away what he has known to, yep. to There's, take on that stage. That is the most clear and right to the point of what I'm saying, trying to communicate. I think we have that sound bite here. Hold on a sec. Just for this. No way. Oh, no, that's not the right one. Oh, do not. There is no try. Okay, I got the wrong one. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we can hear your best Yoda impression. <laughs> <laughs> do or do not. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you ought to do a whole uh, podcast just on the philosophy of Star Wars. That'd be cool. You know, yeah. you, if you're a devotee, that sounds like it's a good, good topic. I know nothing about Star Wars. I was too busy to go watch the movie at the time. Mm, I mean, sure. like, go back and check it out. There's a, this is school related, learning related. Uh-huh. She had shared a, a story. Um, so Luke, before um, you showed up at the coffee shop, I asked uh, um, Paul, like what are top three memorable photo shoot locations? And he explained why. And there's, there's one you had mentioned Italy. Uh, Vietnam, but it was the Rwanda one. Mm-hmm. Um, can you share, Luke, about about that experience? Well, um, Rwanda is, uh, I went there for a job for SC Johnson, which makes Raid and Ziploc bags, and, and they're a family-owned company, so they can make choices based on their opinions, not just on stock price. Where If you're a big company that has stock, you have you are slave to the stock price, and your choice is going to go up and down. So they can make a choice they could affect their business negatively for many years if they want to, because it's their business. And so the CEO, who's like the grandson of the original SC Johnson, wanted to make their products much more green and less uh, chances to make to do cancer or pollute the world. So one of the ideas was to um, make a raid out of perithium, which is a flower. Um, in, the, in Rwanda, they grow this flower. And in World War II, these soldiers were out fighting and they had like lice and whatever. And as they crawled through the field, as they got to the other side, they realized they had none of these bugs on them. They realized it's a natural green bug deterrent. <clears throat> so uh, S.E. Johnson went there and worked with villages, to create co-ops and, um, <clears throat> you know, to help sell this flower to fill this need. So anyway, but the cool thing about Rwanda was that people, um, my fixer there, really wanted us to understand what the, understand what the genocide was and really understand what went down because he was six or eight years old at the time and he he lost everybody in his family and um and it was a horrible story but he really made an effort to communicate so we had a full understanding of that real history from someone that lived it and it was really one of his missions before we left we had to go to the genocide museum with him and learn about this you know his experience because he was telling us little parts but it was interesting because in rwanda um, there's a certain purity of thought there where people aren't denying their history. Like, so easy to deny, you know, like, we could say, well, I don't want to talk about George Floyd. Well, you need to talk about it. It's a horrible thing. It happened. You know, it's it's there. It's in the room. Let's. But in the American way, a lot of times we just want to 
prior to all that, we kind of like, oh, let's just shove that to the side. That never really happened. Mm. But um, in, in Rwanda, the people really wanted us to, the people I was with, they really wanted us to experience that reality of, of what went down the good and the bad. And uh, I found that very powerful. The other thing I found powerful was that um, whenever you're in a country where obviously you're American and you have wealth compared to in, in Rwanda, no matter, probably in my camera bag, I had more than the whole village because they, just, they live pretty simply, right? And a lot of times uh, people come up and they want money or whatever. But the kids in Rwanda wanted pens for school. They didn't ask me for money or dollars. <laughs> Kid, I have a pen. <laughs> and I'm like, and I found that so pure and beautiful to me that I went to the hotel and I, because and I, I didn't have a bunch of pens, I, I would take all the pens from the hotel I could find in the paper and the envelopes and try to create school supplies for these kids. If I ever go back to Rwanda, I'll come bring a boatload of school supplies. And I just found the culture really beautiful because they weren't in denial of their past and they seemed like they were in a pure way trying to move forward together. And uh, everything was very uh, clearly acknowledged. It wasn't um, sanitized. It's, that story is going to stick with me. I mean, there's just so many um, beautiful elements there. Um, for those who don't know what a fixer is, you got to explain it to me because okay, I, yeah. I, I didn't know. So a fixer is when you go to another culture, you want to not offend that culture. You want to do things correctly. So from coming into customs to everything. So you hire what's called a fixer, which is a local person, which speaks the languages, understands the customs, and makes sure that you do not offend anybody and that you leave the place as you found it and hopefully they smooth out any issues that happen if somebody finds themselves in trouble or they make a poor choice um, the fixer solves your problems and knows how to solve all the solutions whether it be cultural or technical or business wise and so the fixer is key when you go to another culture so you don't end up being the ugly american and like stepping on everybody and trashing the place and leaving it just with the, the work that you made, but you left carnage in the way. So anyway, a fixer is key. And um, uh, there may be, uh, in my business, that's like the most important element of working in another culture is having that translated so you leave the place better than you found it, or at least the same as you found it. You didn't affect it in a negative way. Mm -hmm. Do you find, uh, since you've spent so much time in Chicago, uh, you really don't need like a fixer. I mean down in southern illinois um, I, but uh yeah. i guess a mediator or a well i mean you sometimes uh, for certain groups you might need like maybe like we were talking about trying to photograph some migrant workers i don't speak spanish so i'm going to need somebody to help me uh, gain that trust um if you're photographing somebody that's so different than yourself it might be nice to have somebody with you that knows them that kind of certifies you as trustworthy like in chicago you know i will craft a crew based on who I'm photographing or, you know, make sure it's a very comfortable and the person I'm working with feels comfortable. But down here, I haven't, I've only had a couple of times where I've had people with me uh, because of, they helped introduce me to that person and li are the link um, to that person that's so outside of my sphere of understanding. But I want to photograph every kind of people. I don't want to photograph just people I understand. I want to photograph people I don't understand. And those are the hardest for me to reach. And so sometimes those people are, I, I, I'm ambassador or entries mm -hmm. to that area or whatever it is, establish trust. And then once they meet me, then it's cool. But sometimes just getting to that point is difficult. That's, uh, I think our students find that the most difficult, like access, not just to a location, but to a, a person's heart, mind, and soul, mm -hmm. and being able to build that trust. When you told me about how you photographed a Coolio, mm -hmm. like if we were to put Coolio and you in this, in this room, you would think like, why would Coolio choose you as the photographer? Because mm -hmm. uh, totally different um, um, backgrounds. Um, would you share with uh, Luke like how, why Coolio had chosen you as a photographer? <laughs> well, the funny thing about this project is that um, when I was photographing Coolio, he goes, you know what I like about you is you just photographed me like a dude. I don't mean any disrespect to Albert Watson, who's a really famous fashion photographer in New York, but he made me look like a model. And these other guys make me look like what they expect me to be, but you are photographing me for what I am. And that's because my work is very driven about finding a connection between um, authentic feel. And not that I really necessarily capture him, but I read people and I make them be what I think they are in my head because I can't ever really know who they are because I'm not them. But I'm very good at reading people. And he really wanted that authentic 
I'm a dude. He kept saying, I'm a dude, not a model. You know, I'm, you know what people perceive me. I wasn't for him as his perception, but more of what he was. So. How do you, how do you cut to that? How do you cut the bullshit and get to that point? I guess I'm a really good reader of people and I can see fake and um, steer around it because I always want to make pictures that are look different than anybody else's pictures. <laughs> they need to look like my picture. And the way I get to my picture is by drilling down into the, finding that connection with that person where they're going to be, turn themselves over to me for two fifths of a second and then it's done. You know, and I, I really, I just read people. It's an interesting, I was just saying I was in a small town recently and I saw this mo mobile home that half of it was kind of burnt up and half of it was really awesome. It had like an American flag and a big cross and it, it looked really, really like visually stimulating. But I had this certain fear and I trust my, I said, you know, I'm going to come back here with somebody that knows this place because I feel like whatever went down here, I just got a vibe that it wasn't good and I didn't want to be, I don't want to be put myself in that situation. So I have really good natural instincts to the point that if my GPS tells me to go left, but my heart says go right, I'll go right. Because sometimes being lost is better than being found because you find something new when you go the wrong way. But something about that intuition tells me that there's something awesome down that road that I need to experience before I get to where I'm supposed to be going. And so I really trust my gut feeling and how it, where it leads me. And that's how I trust people. And I just read people and I try to distill it down to um, I guess I try to make the ordinary extraordinary. And that's what I'm always looking for is like, what's the most ordinary real part of somebody and how can I make that extraordinary? I don't know if that makes any sense, but it does. Yeah. yeah. When you, uh, stop by the communications building and you, 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 uh, introduce yourself that, and you uh, told me about the project and you gave me the, the postcards uh, with examples of, of work. And, you know, I, I knew some of the people uh, that you had ready photographed. That was a great way to, like, build trust. I mean, we have the mm -hmm. SIU photo thing, right. but being able to, to recognize, oh, that's that's so and so from Cedarhurst. Like, OK, this is this is cool. There's other there was that moment. And being in your shoes before, like access is everything. So yes. I'm thinking, OK, Paul's down here. He needs um, more uh, subjects who are willing, uh, specifically subjects who uh, reflect the diversity mm -hmm. um, on all uh, gamuts, um, whether it's ethnicity, uh, race, uh, sexual sexuality. Um, so, I mean, it took a little while for me to get back to you, but I was running through my yeah. head. I just created this huge list. Of, Which is awesome. Because um, I wanted to... Uh, um, I want Paul to succeed in this. Um, so we were perfect strangers before mm -hmm. I just knew your name. Um, this getting back to something I said earlier, being able to surround yourself with strangers who um, believe in your cause mm -hmm. and, and, and see the genuinity and sincerity. So also I was thinking, uh, knowing that you're wanting a, a more diverse uh, subject, you know, I carry this name, Antonio Martinez, and I'm, we had this talk about uh, the expectations that people probably still uh, um, project on me or think, you know, I'm not fluent Spanish. I can I can read uh, Spanish, but uh, I really, really wish I was Spanish so I could go down to Cobden with you and uh, be that uh, um, the ambassador. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I did think of people on that list who could potentially be make those introductions because right. uh, I think it's uh, very important that uh, this area does recognize all walks of life down yes. here because um, yes. the human ecology, um, ecologically, humankind would be very boring and it wouldn't last long if we were just all same walks of life. Um, it'd be very boring. And I, I really appreciate your help. And that's the beautiful thing about the project is, and any project I've ever done is you meet one person and if they believe in you and they trust you, they, they give you two or three people and those two or three people give you two or three people and it just grows, grows, grows. You gave me like 15 people. So mm -hmm. that was even better. And hopefully those will grow more people. But I really need to drill down in um, ethnic, uh, different sexualities, different points of view as big as possible because, you know, and that is helped by the people I meet and how they introduce me to it. And if I could just give me a, give a plug for my project, if you're interested in this project and you'd like to be part of it, you can write me an email at facesofourtime at gmail.com or you can go to Instagram, paul underscore ellidge, and direct message me. 
If you're interested in being part of it, or if you know somebody that's interesting that you would feel you would like to be represented in this project, I want to photograph everybody. There's not, it's not how you look. It's really trying to find people that have a gratitude for life and are, represent every kind of life. So I want to photograph every kind of person, left, right, center, every color, shape, size. Send me a message or an email and let's connect and make pictures. That's awesome. And I'm just so appreciative, Antonio, for you connecting us and just being here today and hearing this story is just incredible. And uh, I'm very excited about seeing the, the series. And uh, again, so thanks, Antonio. You're welcome. Thanks, Thank Antonio. you, Luke. I mean, this, this whole, uh, I don't know, I don't want to call it a maze. Maybe it's the line of excellence, kind of using um, what Paul's kind of describing. I mean, you kind of let it. I mean, I'm just following you. Well, I mean, there's a lot of influences, you know, so many. Just trying to, yeah, stay on the line. Keep pushing forward. And capture interesting stories. Share, connect, learn, absorb. Unlearn. Share. Unlearn. Unlearn. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for having me. This was very exciting, and I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Is there anything else we want to cover? Anything? uh, This has been a great conversation, and we could go on and on, I know. But I'll I'll come back another time. That'd be great. (laughs) I'd love to have you. I I, I would just end on just be yourself and embrace who you are. And really try to tune out the criticisms of others, whether it be about your opinions, the color of your skin, your sexual preference, your politics, whatever it is, try to be authentic for who you are, not who people, what you think people think you ought to be. Just try to be authentic. And you'll, I, I believe you'll have a really lovely life. That's great. And you'll have a wonderful uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. Antonio, any last messages you want to send out there? Um, follow Paul Hillage. Um, definitely encourage you to, uh, if you're at all interested in um, being a subject and experiencing what I experienced this morning, uh, definitely uh, reach out to him. Um, it's really uh, it. Support the arts. Support Southern Illinois. All right. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you both so much for being here on the podcast. Paul, I'd love to have you back on. Mm-hmm talk some more about the project when it comes out we'll be looking for it all right tonio thank you for being here again it's great to see you Mm -hmm. great to have you back on the podcast let's hear it for you guys all right (laughs) uh thank you for listening thank you for watching uh subscribe to this podcast uh union street podcast we have a new episode every friday at noon central standard time share stories get to see what we got going on here and just talk to people talk to share real stories so again paul tonio thank you guys so much for being here uh, be on the lookout for our next episode and yeah, follow Paul. Paul, can you give that one more time for the people out there? Um, my The email address for the project is facesofourtime at gmail.com or you can go to Paul underscore Elledge on Instagram and direct message me and we'll connect. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for listening. Cool. Thanks for watching. <laughs>